Abend, herzlich willkommen im Depot. Welcome to the Depot. It's a great pleasure for me to have you as our guests together with the art sessions. Um, it's the last day before my maternity leave, so <laughs> so happy you're here. Thank you very much. Um, ich darf noch kurz hinweisen auf unser Programm und unser Newsletter. Das Depot wird heuer 30 Jahre alt und da wird es im im Herbst einiges geben, auch ohne mich. <lacht> und ich bin sehr froh, dass wir unsere Reihe mit heute gut abschließen werden, aber mit die Arts natürlich in der einen oder anderen Form weiterhin verbunden bleiben und äh, noch weitere Dinge aushecken. Und ähm, ich übergebe an Ivana. Danke fürs Organisieren. Ja, danke dir, Sarah. Vor allem für so Möglichen auch. Diese Kooperation und Kollaboration wäre ohne Depot überhaupt nicht möglich und ohne dein Engagement. Um, welcome also from my side. I'm so happy that Marlene is here today because I'm really looking forward to uh, learn more about your amazing uh, practice and also more uh, listen to your thoughts about what you put in in these different lectures and interventions and cooking togetherness and I'm so happy that you're here for our last uh, the art session in the pool. Um, the the art session thinking through practices um, here we take time to like also explore artistic work, uh, work done collectively and within communities um, here is the space to also have this closer look at practices that build uh, solidarity and The main question is how we can bring care into group work and also um, we ask ourselves um, how we can co communicate also responsibly in the arts and in our processes. So today we are focusing on encouraging practices with the wonderful artist collective Myling, which was founded in 2019 in Vienna. Your focus is on um, discussions about racism, homophobia, sexism, and especially from um, or against an Asian flinter um, no? perspective. Perspective, thank you. <laughs> um, and you are all um, contributing as Marlene, so you are also forming your collective and like a hybrid identity uh, rather than promoting yourself individually. I'm so looking to hear more from you and I'm passing the mic to my Ling. Thank you so much for inviting us and having us today and also thank you for coming here. So we are very happy or honored to share our practices as my Ling. Um, already like Ivana introduced us, but yeah, we are founded in uh, 2019 as an artist collective, but we also at the same time we established an association. And especially we were not aiming to, uh, to form a collective, you know, like, okay, we are artists, we are, you know, it's not like that, but actually we came, we went to a coffee together to share like our experiences as an artist, curator, researcher living in Vienna. And we, und uh, we kind of realized that we had so many similar experiences as an Asian you know, female kind of uh, gendered bodies. And, and this uh, experience is coming from the intersectional discrimination, including uh, sexism and racism. And we were very aware of that and we decided, okay, we need to do something together. So that's why this is the biggest reason why we founded Collective. And uh, from the beginning, we uh, also think that my mean should be a platform to share and exchange experiences of you know, racism and sexism, and especially how we encounter this uh, you know, like discrimination in institutions, in the university, in the art institutions, and on the public space. And we also decided my din should be anonymous and collective. So we identify as my din in very different, different levels. Uh, 
and we kind of think that maybe uh, it's not, you know, represented representative of Asian printer position, but it's more about multi-layered voices mm -hmm. and identities. Mm -hmm. And especially why we you uh, we call ourselves Malin is actually coming from very old uh, video sketch. It's it's the same title called Malin. And this video ske sketch is like 30 minutes long uh, uh, soap opera, which was uh, produced in 1979 in Germany by Gerhard Holt. So he's a very famous comedian back then, and still he is very famous. And basically, Mylin is introduced by uh, her husband, played by Holt himself, and she was born in catalog in. Uh, Bangkok, so she is coming from uh, Thailand, and apparently she wears Japanese kimono. And she, uh, you know, uh, Port told, uh, informed that uh, my Lin cooks Chinese food, for example. So, like this video sketch basically showcasing all the you know prejudice and stereotype about you know sexualized, uh, exotized Asian female body. So that's why we decided, okay, we should we pray and reappropriate my limb with a different voices and especially in this video my limb never opened her mouth so she was so silenced and this is how we feel uh, when we encounter racism so we were very silenced and uh, still there are so many projections and prejudice are projected on our body so that's why this is the beginning <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone. So um, one of the biggest things that my Ling gets asked all the time is how do we work collectively, one? And second, why do we claim anonymity uh, within the collective when obviously you can see our faces? No, it's, it's not an anonymity in the sense that we're disguising who we are in front of you, but it's an anonymity in the sense of trying to leave you wondering who is Myling. So the four of us now are just a random collective of Myling members who are representing Myling at the moment. If you had this talk tomorrow, it could be another four members in front of you representing Myling at the moment. So Myling is essentially um, a platform or, or a, a case for whoever wishes to fill it at the moment and whoever has issues they want to bring forward. Um, we've found that this is a really good constructive way to actually fight against a simplification of identity politics, one. And also because as my Ling, we're of course discussing an Asianness that really can't be described as an Asianness because Asia is so difficult to actually describe as just a whole singular thing. So this is also our way of breaking with a monolithic representation of something by saying that, yeah, you can call it Asia, but Asia is so many different things. And we, the four of us, can't even sufficiently um, represent Asia. So th that's the reason why my Ling would like to keep this fluidity and anonymity as its essence because it allows for us to become many different things. So as we say in the slide, yes, we're non-representative of any single Asian nationality and culture. We're fluid and shape-shifting. And through this, we're able to embrace actually a whole lot of complexity within these cultural attributions. Okay, so <laughs> this is, <laughs> we're getting rather deep now. <laughs> <laughs> as we are the conceptual side of my link. <laughs> no, but um, there are really some um, kind of, well, as you know that my link does a lot of activities and one of them is my link reads. So we actually are very much into theory and concept as well. And we borrow a lot from writers and activists who we admire. Um, and one of this would be Edward Glisson, who is a Caribbean black writer who talks about opacity um, through his writings. He's actually also a poet. And opacity is basically a strategy of saying no. Like, I refuse to reveal myself fully. 
right? So it's, there's always a tendency, especially within identity politics, that you have to be representative of. And most of the, of the methods of doing that is to almost over-represent yourself and claim things, no? To be able to say, okay, this is me, da-da, 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 but in a way it's also box ticking. So a lot of times, like, there's no room to leave for complexities that are, yeah, I'm this, but I'm also that. No, because those the things that overlap can't really be within checkboxes. Mm -hmm. You have to either be one or the other. So opacity in glissant basically leaves room for you to be many complex things mm -hmm. and many contradictory things where you don't have to say you're one or the other, but you can be both mm -hmm. and you can be many. So it's within this that Myling also holds its multiplicity and why we can be many very different voices. Um, and that leads us to also the strategy of fluidity um, and this idea of shape-shifting where my Ling and those who are in my Ling can also not only shape-shift in terms of concept but also in terms of how we make art. So, you know, sometimes we're doing film, sometimes we're doing performances, sometimes we're doing straightforward sculpture and installation and sometimes we do somatic practices and this really is only possible because there are many people who can come in and out of my ling as they please mm -hmm. yeah so that's it <laughs> you want to do this Mila? <laughs> the challenge yeah um, so uh, the uh, anonymous fluid collective but obviously this brings a lot of challenge and uh, we have to say I think also the conflict um, so basically um, how do we in terms of like a decision making we try to be non-hierarchical hierarchical I mean of course it's sometimes impossible some way but uh, we are trying to find a different like way of uh, collaborating together within the platform because we are indeed artist collective um, but also want to be a platform so we don't want to have a like directorship for example so when we of course we all are also like perfect like you know the cultural workers and we are working in this field as a professional so we expect professionalism and uh, responsibilities uh, each to each other but at the same time we don't uh, necessarily want to like expose or impose this kind of like uh, the, um, power relations so how actually we can make decisions without this uh, the traditional hierarchical structure with a directorship so basically we don't have a directorship um, but it creates also the challenges. So we always like try to negotiate how is it in the end, I mean, how is it really also possible to yeah, create uh, this fluid uh, artist uh, collective? And also because we are trying to have like a multi voices and non representative artist collective, what does it actually mean? because we all have a different practices and also individual opinions, individual artistic aesthetics. So when it comes to the aesthetics of my lane, how do we actually decide uh, that each uh, aesthetic as my lane or decision as my lane? So it cannot be only like um, democratic way or something. It's really about the uh, constant negotiations. So that's also the, one of the struggle and challenge. We don't know yet the uh, kind of a clear answer to this uh, structure, mm -hmm. but that's also the um, kind of like challenge and a commitment that w that this Mylin as an anonymous fluid collective tried to kind of um, unfold. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> okay, so. Now we're gonna go deeper into actual practices and projects that we've done. Um, so we wanted to begin with Myling Talks. It's actually a video work 
uh, evening as protest and pleasure. So before like talking too much about it, I think I would like to start with the video itself. So this was made in 2020? Yeah, 2020. Yeah, so, so it was the height of the Asian hate because of the COVID pandemic. And um, during this time, uh, my Ling was researching a lot about um, the increasing kind of uh, digital intimacy that we, were, that we were seeking as a very isolated mass population. And also how food came to be one of these uh, pleasures that filled the gaps of loneliness and isolation. Um, but at the same time, uh, food is not food and pleasure is not a neutral subject. There are um, stereotypes against Asian food and what we consider as pleasurable, and so that's also covered in the video. So. Can we make the video a bit louder? So a lot of these sounds in the video are inspired by ASMR. Um, and there's also lots of um, uh, um, inspirations from this movement called mukbang, which is this uh, internet kind of trend where people film themselves eating large amounts of food.
basic human functions. The sight of eating and cooking as a space where you process the world. The pandemic reminds you of your body, makes you consider it, sit in it, feel it more. In the months during the first lockdown, sales of processed food soared and became high in demand.
interacting with food can begin to tap into a deeper exploration of our vulnerabilities and our politics. Pleasure is necessary in surviving and counteracting oppressive structures. Finding pleasure in food in itself also keeps us healthy. Pleasure is a way to cope in these systems and the performance of food can be a form of that. We find temporary solace and ultimately reclaim agency in the world where the policing of our bodies and our food is widespread. Food or pleasure should not be something you are allowed or deserved. My pleasure from food is personal. I indulge with pleasure, I indulge for comfort, and now as protest. So it was from this body of research that uh, we developed a performance called Myling Kalt, We All Eat Dirt. So um, this is a, an image from Wiener Festwochen. So we, this is back in 2022. Um, we turned this into a performance where each of us did kind of like a, um, almost like an essay of like a specific fermented or stinky food that's associated with Asian food. So for example, we had um, like pickled foods, we had like kimchi and natto, uh, we had this uh, century egg. I don't know if anyone's tried it, but it's this black fermented egg that has like almost a sulfuric smell to it. Um, but these are foods that, um, that not only do we enjoy, but they have this history of resilience because they have this fermented quality. You were able to travel with it over long journeys and migrate with it, or um, the fermentation also makes it more nutritious, more healthy for the body. So there's a reason why these foods have survived you know, generations and generations of migration. Uh, so for us, it's a form of resilience to become the foods. So in this performance, we're actually becoming these stinky foods. And at the end of the uh, performance, we invite everyone to eat with us. So we order catering from local restaurant. And I can actually show video of this performance. Sure. Yeah. So I'm just gonna fast forward. Yeah. 
towards the end. Because I like your line when you're like. Do it together. I want to go back more. Do it. I guess this is also the point where um, our performances became more like gatherings because at the end uh, we invited everyone to eat with us and to share these stinky fermented foods. And it's actually a nice segue to um, the next topic, which is the Myling soup bath. So. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so especially Myling uh, Koch sleeves is more kind of talking about how stereotype is also connected to the food culture, and then this food culture also connected to uh, the uh, discrimination or stereotype uh, project around the body. But through this you know, series of performances, we also realized that sometimes always be confronted, confrontational, confrontational. confrontational with the white gaze, it's sometimes energy drained, or we sometimes got very, uh, injured in many, many ways, because we also kind of, we are creating the same trauma or same kind of violence sometimes that, is, you know, like a kind of microaggression that we kind of do performing this microaggression on the performance. And therefore we kind of think that how we really can enjoy food for ourselves and then especially for our pleasure. And especially uh, in terms of pleasure, also like kind of, you know, having food or having fun is sometimes very, uh, st stigmatized, and that especially migrants, or people of color, or uh, the women, for example, we should not have pleasure for all. And then especially in Myling context, Myling was bought, or Myling was brought to, US, uh, to Europe to serve her husband in domestic uh, space, which means that she does not have any her own pleasure. So that's why like, this is for us, it's very important to understand how we can also have uh, our own pl pleasure and also like as collectively, how we can have it. And that's why like for us, uh, thinking cooking as more like a communal or more pleasurable is very important. And we decided to uh, kind of make a performance centralizing our voices, more resonating with other uh, communities, not only like uh, uh, Asian Flint, also like not, you know, toward the white gates. So like kind of the place that centralize ourselves. So uh, Mali Soup Bus is a uh, soup meditation. So it's a kind of meditative kind of performance. Uh, we are inviting um, uh, visitors or participants to, to be part of the medi meditation journey. And we also ask them to cut the vegetable together and stir up hot pot together while sharing their memories of their food. So like their, uh, and this was done first at the Vivencias by, curated by Dins Palmieri and Marisa Lobo. And first uh, there in the participants shared a lot of memories <coughs> that connect to their childhood or their families, or you know their individual stories. So it's kind of for us, it's important to kind of bring these different voices in order to cook one collective soup, and then after the performance, we share the, this you know soup. Though this is a still middle of the uh, pandemic, so we didn't really eat the soup that we cooked together. <laughs> but this is this is how we kind of you know have uh, had a table passing through the participants, so like they are kind of using their hands 
cutting, and then also they're using their voices. So for us, this is a very special performance. Mm. Yeah. So going into dirtiness and stickiness, so this kind of came out of all of the, the food research and performances and interventions that we did. Um, and we're still following in the same uh, vein of just uh, working alongside sensuality or sens uh, sensations, mm -hmm. I guess. And, um, and also uh, s wondering how we can reclaim uh, the dirtiness and the stickiness as you know, these stereotypes that were put onto us. So um, this was the point where we started to experiment with uh, stickiness um, as having its own material agency. So this is actually a very simple recipe for making bioplastics. So this is how we developed yeah, this stickiness uh, material. And what's really interesting about it is that it has its own kind of disobedient qualities. You know, when you try to work with it, it, ha it reacts back to you. You know, it starts dripping and you can't really control it. And also the way it's drying, like it dries in different ways, depending on the surface you apply it to or depending on what the ratio of uh, vinegar and glycerin that you add to it. So, um, as we were working with the stickiness as this kind of material agency, we started to think about how stickiness can also be mapped onto emotions, uh, the way that emotions can be stuck to these stereotypes or stuck to uh, discriminations, or the way that uh, sometimes the past can be stuck to the present. You know, um, uh, we all come from generations of um, migratory experiences or having these hybrid embodiments. And of course, like uh, these are entangled with coloniality, with these very messy histories. So we were exploring stickiness, um, not just on the material level, but also on a symbolic level. And uh, we tried one um, participatory performance at school. It was at the beginning of 2023, and we titled it Stick Together because we, were, we wanted to have uh, the stickiness represent the uh, resilience and the solidarity that you form uh, with others, with community. And so during this performance, we were uh, using uh, mochi or like rice, rice pounding. So it's actually a really a traditional way to make uh, sticky rice or make mochi. You just keep pounding it and pounding it and you create this rhythm actually, this very percussive rhythm. And uh, once we finished making the uh, rice mochi, then we put it in our hands and we went around the audience and we were shaking hands with them with our sticky hands and we said, let's stick together. Um, so this was a, a really interesting performance. Um, and just echoing what Mika said, um, uh, I think this was a point where we started to really pay more attention to our audience because uh, at the school uh, venue, it was kind of a mixed audience. And we realized that, you know, there's some performances that would fit better, you know, with like a like an all POC or BIPOC um, audience, uh, something that is, you know, whether it's like a soup bath where you're sharing memories or you're asking people to stick together. Uh, I think these kinds of strategies work better in a BIPOC setting. Oh, there's the... <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, in addition to the stickiness uh, concept that we are, we have been like ex experienced through the different methods and different occasions, we are very much inspired by the theory called ornamentalism, uh, a feminist theory for the year woman by Anna Lin Chen. Anna Lin Chen is an uh, Asian uh, American scholar who is questioning and who raised the question, is the yellow woman injured or is she injured enough? That means uh, it's not only about the yellow woman as such, but she is really questioning the issues within the uh, female of color and women of color. 
um, about the blind spot because there are uh, like a different uh, like the discussions about, uh, for example, black and brown uh, feminism and there is a genealogy, but often uh, this uh, the specific racialization and sexualization and gendered politics. Um, for Asian women are missed, dismissed uh, in the theory. What it means is that uh, she is uh, discussing how um, Asian female bodies are gendered and sexualized and racialized in the Western society as a hybrid of human and object. And uh, someone, something present as a human being, but at the same time not treated as a human being. And it, uh, often it's an uh, object or ornamental or decorative um, aspect or decoration in a public sphere or in a private uh, sphere as well. So Asian uh, femininity is hybrid. That's uh, what the ornamentalism by Anna An An Lin Chen about. And when we are reading this um, uh, serialization, we really felt that, oh my God, the uh, origin original marine is exactly this hybrid of uh, human, but also she is an object, she is a decoration in the household and who can serve uh, pressure to her white husband. So uh, in the context of Vienna, where we are living and based in, this uh, like ornamentalism in the, uh, and Al Nouveau, um, which uses the female bodies and the plants as a form as of uh, aesthetic vocabularies are very strong and it's really the context and the history here. And this, um, the ornamentalization is also the uh, race, race making. That's the an idea of ornamentalism. And we, as we are talking about this, how to like a reclaim our agencies against white gaze, this uh, the theory is really the foundation of and the great inspiration to continue uh, our uh, projects. And I think I'm gonna then we want to talk about the our latest um, uh, project or the exhibition uh, last year that we did in secession. So the, do you wanna show the video? Or yeah, yeah like we you can. can. Yeah, you can show the documentation. So yeah, um, inspired by uh, the ornamentalism um, in the history uh, the Asian female, in the, you know, in the claim that the Asian bodies are uh, treated as a decoration, pure decoration or ornament to the in the Western society. In the secession, our our title was the not your ornament. So I think it's really clear statement or manifest uh, to reclaim uh, own agency. And we here uh, also uh, explore the concept of stickiness further. Um, in the video, insula uh, video installation as well as the plant installation. So I think um, we're gonna show the whole video later. So we will talk about, uh, we can, yeah, you will have a time to really show the video. Um, but in this exhibition, uh, uh, besides the uh, Orientalism and ornamentalism, uh, we found one specific invasive, uh, invasive plant called kuzu and that becomes kind of like a key uh, protagonist and a role in this uh, new video. So kuzu is a plant and it's, uh, it's called now invasive plant. It's like a, a ivy kind of like a plant and it's called invasive plant. Um, it, was, it, it is originating in the East uh, Asia uh, but then in the uh, 1850s, it was imported to the West, uh, to the States first uh, as an ornamental plant uh, to decorate the cottage and so on. But then later uh, it was in, uh, introduced um, as a kind of plant that can solve and improve the soil erosion in 1930s. So in the Europe also in the same time, this kuzu uh, plant was imported, but then like a kuzu was so strong and 
um, the, its roots are so difficult to eradicate, so it became uh, quite um, uncontrollable. So now it, uh, it is treat, uh, it is uh, registered as an invasive plant, and in, the, in for example in Austria you cannot have it. It's not uh, it's prohibited to have it and. But at the same time, Kuzu is uh, really, um, Kuzu has a kind of like a herbal medical um, properties and healing properties. So especially its roots and root starch uh, is uh, create a sticky substance and it will be used as uh, this it, is kudzu. yeah, this is kudzu, <laughs> and then it will be used for dessert or like it will be um, good, you know, the tea for uh, your health and so on. So we really see this um, <laughs> this dichotomy uh, that are embedded in this invasive plant because in this drawing this history of invasive plants, how they are treated in invasive. Uh, how they are treated as an invasive plant really has a par parallel and similarity to the rhetoric of nationalism and xenophobia and uh, migrant policies in the West. So uh, it was kind of like a great founding for us to find this kuzu or like invasive plant, which has also this ornamental, ornamental aspect and also sticky ab um, aspect. So in this session, um, it, um, yeah, this uh, kuzu plant and its stickiness as uh, something that bring us pleasure, but also uh, resilience and resistance uh, became really uh, the yeah topic in this, this uh, in this exhibition. And when you see the uh, plant installation. Um, in the yeah here um not only about kuzu but there are so many uh, plants are also like we also see the plant as a uh, something that is used as a decorative object in the household especially so there are so many exotic plants which were brought uh, to the West during this horticulture or during the colonialism. And this horticulture colonialism is still ongoing uh, as an exotic, you know, to enjoy, in order to enjoy the exotic plant in, the, in your home and so on. And this uh, ornamentalization and something that needs, that, are, that is expected to serve pleasure is also similar logic with this ornamentalization of Asian bodies. Um, yeah, I think I talked about the voice recordings. Yeah. About the voice recordings? Yeah, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. ah, yeah. yeah. okay, stories, so yeah. Um, oh, mm -hmm. we actually developed this uh, through a performance we did at the Brunnen Passage, um, ah, yes. yeah. <laughs> 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 which is basically, I, I'm blanking on the name, what was I the... Myling Plants. Myling Plants. 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 Who is Myling? No, uh, no, no, it was who is with Myling, Myling, but then it's we name it Myling, Myling Plants. Plants. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's still where it was, it's essentially started as a performance where each my Ling member was holding a plant that meant something to them. So each of these plants, though decorative and from somewhere else, sort of shared this migration story with a my Ling member. So uh, each my Ling member was encouraged to share this, this story within, this, uh, within the space of the Brunnen Passage. Uh, so what you see here is kind of like an installation that was derived from that performance where uh, the plants still uh, resonate with the plants that were picked by each Myling member. And the stories that you hear within it are also, um, part of them are stories from the members about how they relate to this plant. And some of them are also um, looking at the, the histories of each of the exotic plants that are here, yeah. And also multiple languages. In multiple <laughs> languages, I've forgotten the yeah. word. <laughs> it was written and yeah. recorded in um, everybody's uh, sort of mother tongue or first language, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and we also had these, uh, the stickiness also um, very visible in the plants installation. And uh, we're going to show the film later. It's called Becoming Stickiness. And um, yeah, going back to the, the anonymity and the, uh, the lack of uh, directorship, um, this was definitely um, 
an interesting challenge to edit a film without a director, without a single director. <laughs> so, um, and that's, I think that's very visible when you watch the film that you can tell like it's like, oh, it's not one singular vision, but it's like multiple visions. Mm -hmm. Um, um, do you want to talk about yeah. the reading room, maybe? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then especially when we got invitation from the session, we also thought, okay, it's it's really nice, but at the same time, my link it's anonymous, and then like my link can be extended in many ways, and then for us, it's also important to contextualize why my link was born in Vienna and why uh, the how, and then also like which kind of voices we are resonating with. So therefore, one part of the exhibition uh, is really dedicated to uh, there are a lot of uh, groups or collectives or activists that we uh, we have worked with, or like that we are inspired by, or we are kind of collecting the voices from other Asian collectives or other collectives that really like sh uh, sharing a stroke struggling, you know, like the challenges in. How, how we can continue this activity, not just at Artist Collective, but also at the same time, how we uh, extended our voices against uh, discrimination. So we have a leading corner, which is coming from, uh, for example, Pelila is other Asian diaspora collective mm -hmm. who are kind of publishing the genes. Or we also had uh, some individual artistic books about plant col colonizations, and also we have uh, some theory book, including ornamentalism or uh, biolo by biologist. And the, the video that uh, in, in this picture is also like our first manifestation as a video, which uh, we also used the original video by Porto. So it's quite uh, telling a lot how the same sexism and uh, racism is continue nowadays. So for us, this is a big manifestation. And we also put some uh, interviews that we made. We, dis we started during the COVID time. It's called Marilyn Speaks. So like uh, we uh, invited guests to talk about uh, the similar activity. But uh, for us, this is also kind of important to be activated during the exhibition. So I think we you're going to talk about the Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the the together the with my links. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I think the exhibition was on for, was it three two, months? Three? Two months. Two months. Two two months. months. Yeah. Okay. But um, then every Saturday we had a guided tour that was in a different language, led by a different Myling member. Um, so you will see like the posters were in Bahasa Indonesia, some were in Filipino, some were in Chinese. Uh, there was a Japanese tour. And it was really important for us to be able to activate communities, to be able to bring in, and it was free, like entrance was free if you came for the guided tours especially. Like we really wanted to make sure that our communities were able to enter the secession space. I mean, it, because it is the secession and it's kind of, you know, it, in a way it, it rings of exclusivity and, <laughs> just this elitist fine arts positioning and so you don't really find that a lot of communities are comfortable in spaces like this unless you reach out and open its doors and say no this show is actually for you so i led the filipino uh, tour and the last saturday that we did this and it was super well attended we even had sticky food you can see in the middle that's kuchinta right there the brown thing with the coconut um, shavings on top and there was puto which is like a rice cake as well with cheese <laughs> very yellow cheese um, but it was really quite a good feeling to be able to share this with other filipinos in vienna because there was really then this feeling of being able to take over the space, to ask questions, to, to look at the video and the material in their own ways, and to be able to speak in, in Tagalog or in Cebuano or in any other Filipino language that was around, um, to be able to discuss in these um, languages. So yeah. yeah. If may I mm -hmm. add, um, I think we tried to make, I mean, we wanted to do this like a series of uh, guided tours also to make a, a platform 
for uh, the people to come together and uh, get to know each other because also the MyLens connection is also limited. And so when we want to like also invite others and then like they will, I mean they, I mean they will like talk. They can talk about their experiences, and then uh, they can also meet other people who are not necessarily in the art field because we don't want it to also keep this as only like artistic communities. And what happened uh, very beautifully is that somehow each tour was also uh, intergenerational. Mm -hmm. So like they are very like young people, like a teens, and then sometimes like. Uh, grannies, aunties, like aunties, aunties and then it was also some, <laughs> yeah, sometimes like uh, like one auntie, like a in, in one uh, tour, one auntie like told the other, like a younger person that, oh, I know you when you were born, <laughs> and like, oh, how are you, or something like that, and then like, it was really the community, like a, it, it turned out to be really community gathering, and uh, one, uh, one of our like friend, or one uh, friend, also told us later, the, later that uh, it was kind of like a good uh, occasion to speak about racism with my mom because it has mm -hmm. been really, really difficult. Because um, yeah, I mean, different generation uh, struggles in a different way. So sometimes not speak about it. Can, it was and is a uh, protection. And it's sometimes this like, you know, intersectional discrimination is really difficult topic at the diner, I mean, family dinner table. Mm -hmm. So um, of course it's, you know, this one visit to the exhibition does not help, I mean, solve something per and immediately, mm -hmm. but uh, at least to have this uh, the intergenerational um, this uh, dialogue, I would say, was also, I think it was really important part. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Yeah. We're we getting to the end. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so to conclude this presentation, uh, we had a performance lab from uh, Tans Quartier. So we were invited to um, do this five-day research lab uh, with six of the MyLing members. Uh, including uh, someone that we never collaborated with before, mm -hmm. uh, Virginia, um, who actually came from Hamburg uh, for these five days. And then uh, on the sixth day, we had a public workshop. It was an open level workshop. And um, during these five days, uh, we did, um, I was one of the people in the performance lab. Um, we spent like the first two days just sharing emotional experiences um, relating to family, to migration, to uh, existing in white spaces, being you know tokenized as the only Asian in white spaces. So it was a lot of that. And then the last three days were like, okay, let's move together. And um, the really interesting thing that came out of the workshop was um, was just how we translated our Asianness into a somatic practice that can be shared with um, with an open level um, participants, and we structured it in three parts. The workshop. So in the first part, we had these different stations, and the participants could move from different stations, and they can just um, basically uh, copy our typography. Um, so typography, um, as you know, has a very, um, you've seen these like uh, Asian typography for like Asian restaurants or Asian fast food restaurants. There's like this font that's called like uh, chop, chop suey or chop something. Suey, yeah. yeah, and it was like invented in like the 1970s or something. And so these are, um, we were drawing on typography as a form of like almost like a fake accent that you would speak out loud, but instead it's in a visual representation through the font. So um, so with our bodies, we want to remake this typography into our style and something that we can claim. So each station, we were teaching the participants our special typography. And, uh, and of course, the typography is through movements and it's through uh, nonverbal communication. A lot of us were using sounds that our mothers would tell us, like, like, eh, 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 eh. You know, it's like a way of saying, no, no, no. But it's, you don't say the word no, you say, eh, 
you know? So it's like, um, so we realize like uh, what we share with a lot of our families is like, even though we're from different Asian backgrounds, is that a lot of the communication is nonverbal. It's just with sounds or it's just with looks, like the stares that our mothers would give to us if we're doing something wrong, you know? <laughs> and then we know like, oh, like, okay, don't do it anymore. So uh, we, we found this commonality between us and we were teaching it to the participants. And then in the second exercise, we did something called instant uh, composition or improvised composition where uh, each person in the composition is given a role and uh, a location in the scene and an action that they have to do. And then we just play the music for 10 minutes and it's all just improvised. So it's really like a, um, a beautiful way to come together and to stick together through these very randomized um, roles that we take on and um, and it was kind of an, an exercise in in collectivity in improvised collectivity and then in the last part so this is the last part is where we actually try to stick together and so um, all of us came up with this choreography that's inspired by various Asian dances and um, we started with a very uh, kind of percussive kind of uh, movement, so symbolizing the heartbeat of the collective. And then we started to move in, into this kind of more fluid shape. And then, oopsie. And then once we demo, demoed this choreography, then we invited everyone to join us and extend the line. So the whole room, like we had this very, very long line that stretched from one side of the room to the other. And the goal was to move as one organism and stick together through each movement. So it was super beautiful. Um, yeah, so that's basically where we are with our research at the moment. Like we're very much into reconnecting with our bodies, our histories through movement and somatic practices. And sound. And sound too, <laughs> making the sounds, yeah. And, um, and yeah, we're very much still on, this, on the concept of stickiness, I would say, but just translating it more in a somatic practice. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I think, <laughs> no, hope you can also like grasp some, you know, like many things because many apparently have so many different activities, I would say. So like a, you know, smaller thing is, you know, three or four people reading books monthly and then some are coming to, you know, this somatic uh, way of understanding stickiness. And of course we do sometimes a lot of, you know, activism more underground mm -hmm. way or more as a public voices. But I mean, apparently it's stickiness has been very important concept for us. And then it's this stickiness showing a lot of both way of being sometimes confrontational, but at the same time being having a fun or pleasure together. So for us, it's, it's quite important to understand how uh, the, you know, two different things can exist or like a, we can do both because sometimes when we kind of switch our p practices toward more our healing or pleasure, also some uh, crit criticizing us a lot because we are not angry anymore, for example. And <laughs> I mean, th this is true. I mean, this is the thing. Of course, we all the time need to point out the, how the society is, you know, like bi violent, but at the same time, we also need to kind of heal from that violence. So that's why like, this is for us, it's important mm -hmm. to, to keep both sides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, we wanted to show you a 20 minute video, if you still have the patience for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's the video that was shown at the secession. Uh, so we'll try to make this as much of a cinematic experience <laughs> for you as possible. And we'll dim the lights and we'll show you the video. And then after that, I guess, we could either just be at the bar and have a very informal conversation <laughs> with everyone for questions or we can come back up front and you can ask us 
questions from here as you like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, just a disclaimer, so at this session, um, this was a two-channel video that uh, was- Across from each other. Yeah, yeah. they yeah, were yeah, played each opposite each to each other, but here they're playing side by side. So um, in the session, the reason why we had it playing on opposite sides was to literally disorient the audience. So literally you had to look left and right, left and right constantly to really uh, capture the whole, the whole film. So, but here you have it side by side. So. Okay. And can we dim the lights? Yeah. Orientalism is not just making imaginary distinctions between the West and the Orient. It is how bodies are shaped by facing in the same direction. It is how the world takes shape around their bodies. How do our bodies occupy space at home and as home? In a way, we learn what home means when we leave home. As bodies move away, they may as well arrive as they re-inhabit spaces. is a semi-woody vine plant originating from East Asia and shares a long evolutionary history and entanglement with humankind. Kutsu's leaves can be cooked like spinach. Their stems can be woven into baskets and textiles. And their roots have hormone balancing properties that can be extracted into powdered starch to make sticky foods. However, it is known in the West as an aggressive, invasive plant. In Austria, Kutsu is prohibited by law to be grown and released into nature. Although sighting of Kutsu have been reported in bordering countries like Switzerland, Italy, and Slovenia. The basic idea of 19th century Orientalism states that Asia is always ancient, excessive, feminine, available, and decadent. 
The desire to possess and to occupy makes the Orient not only objects of desire, but also as resources for world making. Ornamentalism is a fantasy about turning objects into persons that paradoxically allows us to abandon our humanness. We see ourselves in Kuzu in the way our Asianness is a hybridized embodiment of human and object. Both a flower and a weed. Painted by the white Eurocentric imagination. We see ourselves in Kutsu as another vegetal other, searching for belonging amongst alien lands and devastated ecologies. We see ourselves in Kutsu as we navigate the exhaustion of life, land, identity, migration, and survival. Under a colonial gaze, both ourselves and Kudzu are shaped by politicized dichotomies. We are the, the decorative, decorative, invisible, exotic, exotic unwanted, unwanted fashionable, dirty, adaptive, invasive, transformable, passive, resilient, and immovable. companions along the same journey. We are aliens searching for a home. There are multiple horizons depending on one's point of view. There might be what is east of you, the east side of the city where you live, or the eastern side of the country. But somebody's east becomes the east, as in one side of the entire globe. Reflecting on the lived experiences of migration might allow us to pose the very question of orientation.
the Orient is the known West. In the same way, boundaries mark a distinction between the self and the other. To become Oriental is both to be given an orientation and to be shaped by the orientation itself. Kuzu was brought to the Western world in the late 1800s as an ornamental plant for its exotic and flagrant purple blossoms. Europäische Königreiche schickten Botanikerinnen, Forscherinnen und Wissenschaftlerinnen durch die Welt, um ihre exotische Pflanzensammlung anzulegen und zu bereichern. Diese Pflanzen wurden hergebracht als nicht einheimische und exotische Spezien, die sogenannten Neophyten. Neophyten, das sind laut Definition Pflanzen, die nach 1492 nach Europa eingeführt wurden. Es gibt Unterschiede zwischen Neophyten und invasiven Neophyten. Sie werden als invasiv bezeichnet, wenn sie unkontrollierbar sind. Problematisch ist es, wenn man jetzt so streng ist und einen Status quo konservieren möchte und sagt, diese Pflanzen sind gut und diese sind schlecht. Dieses binäre Denken zerstört Diversität. Kutsu spreads like wildfire, growing up to 30 centimeters per day. It climbs vertically up trees while spreading horizontally over bare soil. By the 1970s, Kutsu was demoted to the status of a weed. With phrases like terrorizing native species and stealing land, Kutsu eradication campaigns parallel the language used to disparage immigrant and diasporic communities. Kutsu's large tubular root structures are nitrogen fixing. They feed and nourish the soil while holding it in place. 
For this same reason, it is also incredibly difficult to eradicate. domestication are not private. They involve the shaping of collective bodies, which allowed some objects to be within reach. what is far away. We take the direction of a wish and a desire. The exotic is not only where we are not, but it is also future orientated. as a place we long for and might yet inhabit together.
Thank you. So I guess, should we just head to the bar? Or, <laughs> yeah? Over, or if you have... Yeah, thank you so much for uh, the really amazing insights of your work. Um, I really love your approach that you like have these spaces for healing but also for political articulation. So it's not about that, but um, I wanted to ask you, because your approach at the beginning, 2019-20, as I saw it, was like aesthetically really a clear political message. And now you're like, uh, from my perspective, changing a lot in like more in this aesthetic, um, finding your own aesthetic and also more artsy approach maybe. Um, is this like a change or is this the way it's going or is this like only always a question of, okay, this is, the stickiness is now our, we're working on stickiness and for this we found this format, or is it like, this is the way it goes? Sorry, um, I don't know if it was clear. I think the, I think the, the way I interpret it is that in the beginning it was very much about, you know, naming the racism, protesting, being somewhat angry or um, and uh, and also being more like disruptive with like the stinky foods and mm -hmm. things like that um, and then also doing lots of like uh, conceptual research but I think now it's more about embodying that research and really exploring it on a somatic and on a collective level I think like being provocative was somehow needed at the beginning because as Mary said, it was about really the na naming the racism because it was hardly recognized mm -hmm. in Austrian context. Mm -hmm. um, so, but then I think also um, because uh, of the kind of realization that we will be so exhausted if we do, if we are so only being provocative mm -hmm. and naming racism uh, or sexism or this like intersectional uh, discrimination. And I think it was already in the presentation that we are saying that, you know, we needed to think of our uh, fun and pleasure for <laughs> ourselves and this like artistic articulation or like direction to the artistic articulation is also for kind of like a collective pressure. Um, also, I think especially this sticky production for the secession, as, uh, as uh, also like Miwa told uh, about ornamentalism, for us it's also important to deal with the aesthetic. Because like aesthetic is already part of the lace making, why we cannot make some ornament for ourselves or like becoming ornament or like this is our beginning because like if because especially Anna Lin Chen is saying that we are not seeking for humanness but we are kind of how we can service this hybrid situation because this is already our condition how to live or how to survive here so like for us this is also like a challenge for us to explore this challenge in aesthetic level and then all this aesthetic level also affect how we work in material level, I guess. So like this is for us, I think it's very like a starting point, like how we really actually deal with the aesthetic. Because like always pointing out is, I think the, it's not easy, but this is the kind of beginning. And then how we deal with the aesthetic through many ways. So I think I see this transformation through in this, Way because I think it's uh, as as uh, for us stickiness of course is a conceptual but at the same time material so aesthetic is also the same it's conceptual way but also like material way how we can make aesthetic making yeah do you want me to add mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah I think my ling has grown up in a way because in the beginning you can mm. see that it was very much an angry my ling too. <laughs> Um, naming the prejudice, naming the injustice, naming like a lot of things. Like there was a need for articulating it and, and saying it out loud. But then after you do that, where do you go from there? How do you open it up where you don't stay at that level of just being angry, mm -hmm. but then move it on to a more productive sort of force? 
like how do you take that anger and then maybe uh, build a space for yourself where then you can create within this without forgetting where it's from, but then uh, something that's more future oriented too, like in a, mm. in a more productive and pleasurable way. I think so. I think that's where my ling is heading. Yeah. yeah, I think also yeah. this is also how we uh, how we can against identity politics, right? Because like we are saying that you know like Melin is Asian descent collective, and that's true, but we don't want to confine ourselves within this uh, a, like a Asian check as well. So and then also. Um, as Steph said, I mean, Asia is such is already like a so term loaded term, and we cannot have uh, one Asianness anyway. So this, like, when we are saying that Asian decent collective, it's already some in a, some way problematic. So <laughs> <laughs> kind of, you know, I mean, how we can like yeah talk about this? So it's all in yeah. yeah. This aspect is also played in the role, like how we kind mm -hmm. of like. Uh, get rid of this humanness that or Asianness that are constructed in the very specific Eurocentric uh, and imperial imagination, and how we can get out of it. Yeah. Uh, I just want to add that uh, we also don't want to confine ourselves to only art making, mm -hmm. because that's only serving a very um, exclusive and specific audience. Mm. Um, that's why it was really important for us to have, you know, together with My Lings, the guided tours, yep. so that we could bring people who are not from the art world into this art space. Um, mm. But ultimately, I mean, we want our reach to, to go to a larger audience. Like, again, like anyone can be My Ling. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Can I add one more thing? Mm -hmm. Because I think uh, from the beginning, I think we now have more <laughs> different access mm -hmm. to different media or different way of uploading to authority, I would say. Because like at the beginning, of course, what we could is to do some artistic intervention because this was the only means that we had. But right now we kind of also navigating ourselves if something uh, injustice happened, we know that it's, you know, only artworks is not the only place that we express. Because if we need a protest, we do our proper protesting procedure. So like writing letter to institution, going to the institution to, to say, hey, this is not good. So like sometimes this protest should not, you know, doesn't have to happen in the artworks. Mm -hmm. So I think we have kind of negotiated ourselves, okay, like in, which occasion we are using and which voices we want to emphasize on. So I think for this artwork, especially we want to use our voices for ourselves. But when we have some, of course, we have still a lot of ugly voices, but these voices mm -hmm. should go to the you know, institution directly, not to, through other audiences, for example. So mm -hmm. this is also like, a, I think after five years or something, mm -hmm. we kind of also like understand, you know, like a, what's the way mm -hmm. uh, well, which way is the kind of uh, importance we have to take? Yeah. Thanks so much for the insights. There was another question. Uh, very shortly, when you mention aesthetics, can you elaborate a bit more on how you approached aesthetics, especially in the last video you showed, in connection to ornamentalism? Um, we knew that exhibiting at secession would be a challenge because we didn't want to reproduce the, the same aesthetics and the westernized, re westernized gaze on Asian female bodies. So in, in essence, we didn't want to become ornaments again and reproduce this kind of gaze at the secession. Um, and I wouldn't say that we have like a singular aesthetic mm -hmm. that we prescribe to. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's still like um, this semblance of multiplicity or multiple voices um, in our collective aesthetic. Um, I think if anything, if I were to generalize an aesthetic that we have, it's, um, it's based on the collective. You know, it's based on, um, yeah, like a collective imagining um, uh, if you see the film, like you can see that it's um, 
uh, like, yes, I was the main editor, but it was like many <laughs> different inputs that I was trying to filter into one film. So, um, so I think that's really important that we embrace that kind of complexity, that there could be multiple visions happening at the same time. And, um, and it doesn't have to be cohesive. It doesn't ha even have to make sense. And I think we try to embrace mm -hmm. that kind of complexity. Are you asking about the aesthetic of the exhibition within the secession, like the, the video? Or or this video. video. In the video. Yeah. This video, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the, actually the um, messiness is also kind of like a one part, like a dirt. I mean, of course, that does cannot, you know, we, we cannot just say that, oh, this is a messy aesthetic or something. It's again difficult. But uh, in the Mylene's practice, uh, in this video too, like uh, the stickiness um, and with this kind of like, you know, the different random objects and so on. And that's like how we kind of like also embrace the dirty part of the history. And that's uh, somehow this kind of like texture that creates this uh, the disgusting kind of feeling that's also like somehow like taken into this consideration in this video. Mm -hmm. Uh, not only like you know how uh, these bodies are moved in this um, together in the last part. Mm. Yeah, I feel like the aesthetics of this video are very sound driven actually. <laughs> if, if that makes any sense to you. It's actually not a visual thing but it's more the sound that guides you through it. Um, I feel like it's a stronger impression. Like it, it's almost like uh, the film is a choreography of sound mm -hmm. with us moving through it. Mm -hmm. Is my thing. Like I, I think like the. I don't know if in aesthetics, if you mean like the color palette of it, or if you mean like certain choices of angles or certain framework. Like maybe you could like break apart what it is you mean by the aesthetics. Um, no, I, I think I don't have to say much, but yeah, the combination of music and the visuals, the point of view, the gaze, how you connect the bodies, how you create patterns, the vertical view, all of this makes sometimes sense in one way and sometimes the other. Mm. I think um, in that sense, I have difficulty in getting your uh, visual, especially visual, uh, aesthetic point of view in a way if it's kind of really referring to I, I got some connections to ornamentalism that mm. you're dealing with but I couldn't sometimes catch the connections if it's kind of really subverting the ornamental mm. representation mm. or working in the way with it so it was a bit vague I think it's okay to be vague mm -hmm. but yeah I just wanted you to elaborate a bit more just mm -hmm. to hear why you make it awake or the way mm -hmm. why you make it awake. Mm -hmm. just, just, um, I think it's because we saw this as a video installation too within the space. So a lot of our framing was actually within the secession mm -hmm. as well and a lot of the other elements into the installation that mm -hmm. gave a nod to this ornamentation. So it wasn't necessarily all centered within the film, mm -hmm. but with all the different elements that surrounded the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, perhaps it's, it would be the script that ties everything together. Mm -hmm. Because I think um, what we were trying to portray was this journey of discovering the kudzu plant. And by discovering the kudzu plant, we're discovering our own identities as you know, migratory bodies, as decorative objects, as ornamental bodies, etc. And then in the last chapter, there's no script at all. And it's because we actually try to embody that complexity and that stickiness through multiple bodies. Um, I think also we intentionally used different type of like camera works and different type of camera like sometimes like in the field work it's really like you know the 
it looks like a almost like you know iPhone documenting like you know we go into the forest, but like some part is really like you know it's clearly I mean like shown that it's you know the the filmed with the film crew from the you know the yeah. drone and so on and some part are yeah more like um, like depicting the street and it has really so many perspective and gaze or position of the eye and that's mm -hmm. I think can imagine that some uh, it looks maybe confusing but I think also I mean we're in the installation like this disorienting feels feeling perhaps dizzy or you don't get it but because you need to yeah. look to screens and this like disorienting the bodies and disorienting the like the way of knowing is also one part that we are trying to play with um, yeah I wanted to ask if you could recap what happened at uh, Donau Festival, because <laughs> I think you had a very situational approach then. And I wanted to ask also if this kind of approach is typical of your work. The approach, as in like when we critique the institution? Or? Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> so that's well. interesting. Um, so for us, we were kind of put in this position where we have to say something, but it's not our labor to perform. You know, it's not our labor to point out all the flaws and the racism in a particular institution, but the responsibility fell on us at this particular event, you know, Donau Festival. Um, we performed, we did three performances uh, after the second performance, we had learned about the Festival Reader. It's a publication that they sell, um, I think, like for 12 euros per, per no. publication or something. Like, yeah, 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 and um, and it was all published in German. So, and none of us are native German speakers. And um, one article in particular uh, was called Painted Black, and it was written by a, a German scholar. Uh, or an, a German expert yes, or a music uh, critic, critic. Uh, and he was writing about Afro diaspora, diaspora music. And in the article, he was promoting the use of the N word, and he was also promoting um, that um, it's okay and it's a form of satire to. Um, that the, the slaves would dance with the masters after they finished their work. Like it was just um, basically just saying it's fine to appropriate black music and black culture. And uh, we, um, we were approached by some master students from the uh, academy mm -hmm. and they had translated the text for us in English. And after we read it, we decided on the third performance we would we would do the usual performance, but instead of serving food, we would serve a protest. So we, uh, we stopped all production and we, uh, we invited other artists of color who were part of the festival to also speak. Uh, we also made it a, a live streaming so that other Mylings could join. And um, afterwards, we had a very long discussion with the director of the Dono <laughs> Festival. Um, Publicly or? Hmm? No, Sammy, uh, Sammy. Sammy. Well, no, he, Sammy. he basically pulled us to the side after the performance to confront us about the protest, mm -hmm. essentially. But mm -hmm. before the performance, he refused to speak to us, mm -hmm. though we had made it clear to the curator in charge of the performance that... No, you know, we did it secretly. Oh, yeah, true. No, we did. <laughs> Sorry. We didn't We didn't tell. tell. We didn't tell. We didn't tell. We didn't but tell. we told, we told <laughs> the uh, curator that we're not going to serve the food, food that's true. and yeah. we also decided to open the space for everyone anyone who wanna want wanted to enter the space because uh, i think first and second performance was limited to 20 or 30 persons 40 40 persons because of the food yeah, yeah because, because of the food yeah, yeah but i think the last performance uh, because the this protest we kind of told later we want to open to everyone 
without telling what we would do, mm -hmm. because uh, as we know that uh, the student already did uh, intervention about this publication, and then they invited the director to talk about these things, but he kind of basically refused, because he said that this is not his responsibility, but it's responsibility of the author. So that's why like, we knew that, okay, that the, as a festival, they didn't do anything for that. So that's why like, we thought that it's important that we should bring this issue to the public. Mm -hmm. Because if already like other people did some trial, you know, to bring this issue, hey, this is a problem, and if this is, that didn't work, I think if we have a place to say something, I think uh, Malin should be the platform for this. So that's why we decided instead of serving food, we serving this dirty mm -hmm. racism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think also, I mean, it's not necessary about like this uh, reader. Of course, reader triggered ourselves and we felt really that, you know, we really wanted to cancel even the uh, performance, but we didn't. But uh, it's also the condition that we, needed to go through during the production. There was also like a mistreatment because maybe we did this, we do this kind of like food performance and then I don't know, maybe we look like, we probably don't look like an artist in this like white society perhaps. So this kind of like, you know, this uh, uh, prejudices are happening so much and sexist microaggression, racist microaggressions are already happening in the production. So it was somehow like the, our anger, accumulation of our anger and frustration. And then with this reader, yeah. really triggered us to really say no to this institution because this condition is not only about this journal festival. We also see, of course, you know, to some degrees, um, I, I mean, we wouldn't say that all the institutions are toxic, but still there are this, um, there are, um, the institutions are incorporating and uh, internalizing this kind of uh, racial or sexual um, uh, injustices. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's also the accumulation. Yeah. yeah. And our point with that protest was we thought it was very unethical of the institution to make us complicit to that reader because this reader mm -hmm. was supposed to be something that summed yeah. up the entire Donau Festival. But when you publish it in German and you invite all these artists of color, so like the other protesters were a South African group, and then don't make it available for them to read. And then we suddenly find out that this was in the reader that was supposed to then um, frame the entire festival. Then, you know, it, it, without our knowledge, we had a hand in this. Mm. We were put in this framework without mm. our consent. Mm -hmm. So. For that, we, we really then push the protest because mm -hmm. it's unfair to be made complicit to something like this. Mm -hmm. yeah. how, how did it, um, what happened next? <laughs> I mean, the, um, with, the, <coughs> with the director? <coughs> or like with your, um, oh. <coughs> with the person who wrote this? Mm. Or what were, the, were there any consequences for you or for other people involved? I think in the end they pulled out the reader. Uh, they pulled the reader off the racks uh, so it couldn't be sold anymore. Uh, there was an official apology from the Donau Festival uh, for it. Um, it took a while. Of course the initial reaction during the confrontation was, well you didn't understand what that article was about. Mm -hmm. This was the thing. It was tongue in cheek. He was saying it in a sarcastic way. It's supposed to be understood through his 600 page book that he wrote beforehand. <laughs> no, all of this, like there was of course all of this um, kind of um, defensive uh, posturing um, until it became clear that of course, like not everyone has access to a 600 page book and reads it in that way. It could also be read by very intelligent people as something um, straightforward where he's saying it's okay to do blackface, which was essentially the point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was written in such a way where actually the arguments weren't even uh, very smart, if I can be honest. It was like, I can say the N word because I have a black friend. 
you know, like, are we really at this point of discussion? Yeah. Oh, I admire, yeah, because it's yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Logic. And then he also kind of mentioning the same way to the, you know, gender asterisk. You yeah. know, like, she, gender asterisk. Because she, he's basically talking about both gender asterisk and, and black facing as a, you know, like gender asterisk is, you know, yeah. ideology. ideology. So that's why like, he doesn't. So basically, so basically this, yeah. yeah. It, it was one of these articles that was like bait, mm -hmm. uh, bait for people to react to. Mm -hmm. And essentially then he gets to step aside and be like, see, look at all you guys reacting to it. You are these kinds of people that this overly correct, mm -hmm. politically correct people that I'm talking about in mm -hmm. this article that can't see the nuances between the asterisks, the blackface, and how we can use it culturally. So mm -hmm. essentially, the, the article was really something that made fun of a whole culture that was trying to articulate yeah. a kind of, of yes. violence yeah. that was being done. And this coming from like a white German writer, mm -hmm. male white German writer, so. Yeah. And that I also, I mean, of course, we should not go <laughs> to detail. But, yeah. but you know, like, for example, he was mentioning that, OK, uh, many white people want to be a black person because they are cool. But who want to be a, you know, become a, yes. yes. But it, exactly, but he was also talking about, but nobody want to be a, a Chinese, for example. What does it mean? I mean, this is, a, this is the level of racism. Yeah. And then how, you know, like he kind of categorized, like, you know, who is cool, you know, because of Western people and then admire we were, this. We were yeah. supposed to yeah. see it as a cheeky article and exactly. not take offense. Yeah. <laughs> because if we took offense, then we were like these, you know, overly politically correct people <laughs> who couldn't take a joke. Mm -hmm. So essentially, it was all framed against being able to react or protest mm -hmm. against it. Mm -hmm. And then the mere act of protesting against it was kind of almost like falling into that trap that he had set out for the article. Mm -hmm. And there we were complicit to this, no? Mm -hmm. So it was really just like a no, like a straight out no, we refuse. Mm -hmm. And this took a while for the festival to figure out. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we are already two hours, so yeah. I'm very sorry. I have to end this here, <laughs> but let's move on to the bar and yes. keep fighting. And, and we're, we're yes. very excited to see what comes and what direction my link takes. Thank you so much. And thank, uh, you. thank you, the whole team, thank the arts. And thanks for coming. Good night. Thank you.